Scripture reading this morning is taken from Paul's first epistle to Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not gre greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as, serve as deacons, if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Paul indicates the occasion of his first epistle to Timothy in the book's first seven verses. I understand seven doesn't make come. Um, I need to work on my mathematics, but in, yes, in, in the epistle's first seven verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law, without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. For reasons Paul does not specify them. He departed from Ephesus while heretics still troubled the congregation. And as will appear from the chapters that follow, while the congregation lacked elders and deacons to govern it. Paul left Timothy behind in Ephesus to correct these deficiencies, however. And he offers Timothy instructions as to how to go about this in 1 Timothy. 
These instructions appear principally in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, which we just read. And in 2 Tim excuse me, and in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. The second of these selections. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Yes, read as follows. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Excellent. I see I clipped it there to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Should have done likewise in my notes. Now, however, considering only what's on the PowerPoint, of the more perceptive among you have probably already fixed your attention on the most problematic sentence in this passage, which spans 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Some of you may think, wait a minute, I've been caught that God... I've been taught that God predestined some persons to salvation and others to damnation, some to be saved, others to be damned. And yes, that is precisely what Scripture teaches. In Romans chapter 9, verses, verses 10 through 18, we read accordingly. When Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. All of Scripture is God's Word, as we read in 2 Timothy 3.16. All of Scripture is breathed out, the opneustos, by God. God, moreover, does not contradict himself. For as Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, 
If we are faithless, He, that is God, remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. When God inspires Paul to write in 1 Timothy 2.4 that God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, therefore he cannot mean by these words that God yearns for the salvation of all people in the way you might yearn to get into a certain college or attain a high score on the SAT. For scripture states in terms so clear as to be unmistakable that nothing can defeat God's sovereign purpose. In Psalm 135, verse 6, we read, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. For the Lord has purposed, writes Isaiah, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? In your hand are power and might, says Jehoshaphat to the Almighty, so that no one is able to withstand you. Or, as Job absorbed, observes more pithily of God, what he desires, that he does. In 2 Timothy 2.4, consequently, Paul cannot mean to say that God wants to bring it about that everyone would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For that is not what actually happens. And when Christ's words... The gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to, lo leads to life, and those who find it are few. This is not because anyone is successfully resisting God's efforts to save him or her, moreover. For as Paul writes of God in Romans 8.30, those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The God whom no one is able to resist saves every person he foreordains to salvation, therefore. And Jesus himself says the same thing in John chapter 6, verses 37 and 39. All that the Father gives me will come to me, he says. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. Hence we read in Acts 13, 48, when Paul preached in Pisidian Antioch, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Whatever Paul means in 1 Timothy 2, 4 then, he cannot possibly mean that God desperately wants to save everyone without distinction and fails to do so only because stubborn human beings refuse his appeals and stand in his way. For, as we read in Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. What then, some of you may ask, can Paul mean when he writes, this is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior? 
who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. To answer this question, we need to remember that often in Scripture, God speaks to us in anthropomorphic language. Language to which we can relate and which expresses important truths, but does not express them literally. Scripture claims that God hears our prayers. Yet God, setting the subject of the Incarnation to one side for the moment, does not literally hear our prayers. He has no ears. Scripture tells us, of per Scripture asserts that God speaks to us in its pages. Yet God does not literally speak. He has no mouth. Scripture tells us a person is drawing near to and going far from God. But inasmuch as the divine nature is present everywhere, we know that even if we make our bed in Sheol, God is right there with us. Nevertheless, we speak of drawing near to and running far from God because these metaphors express vividly the experience of increasing communion with and obedience to God in the one case and the experience of growing alienation from God in the other. Likewise, Scripture sometimes says God, that God wants something, not because He literally wants it, but because He commands us to act in a certain way. You all know when your earthly father says, I want you to do your homework. He is commanding you to do your homework. And when your mother says, I want you to do the dishes. She is commanding you to do the dishes. Similarly, on many occasions, Scripture says that God wants something, not because He literally desires it, but because He commands human beings to do it. In 1 Thessalonians 4.3, accordingly, Paul writes, this is the will of God, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Here Paul manifestly does not mean to say that God is trying to keep the Thessalonians from sexual immorality. If Paul knew that God willed the Thessalonian sexual purity in that sense, he would probably not think it necessary to warn them. For as Paul himself writes in Ephesians 1.11, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. When Paul writes, this is the will of God that you abstain from immorality, therefore, he means God commands you to abstain from sexual immorality. When Paul tells bond servants in Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 6, Obey your earthly masters, doing the will of God from the heart. He plainly speaks of the will of God in the sense of God's commandments. Paul knows that the bond servants will do God's will in the sense that they will do what God tries to move them to do. For as we have already seen, God does all that he pleases. God does according to his will. God does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stay his hand. When Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2.4, that God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth consequently. 
he probably means that God commands everyone, everywhere, to confess the truth about Jesus Christ and thereby be saved. This meaning fits the context, for in the following verse, Paul offers as reasons why God commands everyone to believe and thereby attain salvation. First, that there is only one God and and second, that there is only one mediator between God and man, God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Human beings are not free, therefore, to worship their own gods and follow their own ways of salvation, which particularly suit their outlooks and cultures. For inasmuch as there is only one God, and only one mediator who offers to reconcile us to that God, human beings can find salvation only in the one Christ. Truly, as the Apostle Peter states, there is salvation by no one else, for there is no other name under, under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Having spent longer on 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5 than we desired, let us now proceed at last to the third selection of verses in which Paul's principal instructions to Timothy appear. And here, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read these again. This 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 13 you can see on the PowerPoint, that's what we read for the scripture reading this morning, right? Where Paul outlines to Timothy the qualifications of overseers and deacons. Now, let's talk about what that mean, Paul means by, in all that. Note that Paul identifies two and only two offices in the church. Overseer and deacon. Elsewhere, Scripture makes it plain that the offices of overseer, that is, episkopos, from which we derive the terms bishop and episcopal, and elder, that is, presbyteros, from which we derive the terms presbyter, presbytery, and presbyterianism are one and the same. An overseer is an elder and vice versa in the usage of Scripture. For Scripture uses the titles overseer and elder interchangeably. Paul tells Titus, a figure not unlike Timothy in 1 Timothy, excuse me, in Titus, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, for instance, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or subordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. Likewise, we read in Acts 20.17 that the Apostle Paul and Miletus sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to him, to come to him. In the following verses, then, one reads a speech Paul delivers to the Ephesian elders a speech that includes the line, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers 
that he made the elders overseers to care for the church of God. In Scripture, then, the office of overseer, episcopos, is the same as the office of elder, presbyteros. Scripture then speaks of only two offices that are to continue in the church until the eschaton. First, overseer, overseer slash elder, and second, deacon. Pastors, incidentally, are elders. They are teaching elders, admittedly, who play a different role than ruling elders, but they do not hold a higher rank. We call ourselves Presbyterians because our churches are ruled by elders who supervise the deacons and the rest of the congregation. We do things differently, therefore, and I am almost to the end, than Episcopalians who believe that there are three offices in the church the overseer or bishop who rules as a monarch over all others, then elders over whom the bishop reigns, and finally deacons who occupy the third rank and care for the temporal affairs of the church. No, we who consider the offices of overseer and elder one and the same call ourselves Presbyterians because, unlike Episcopalians, we do not elevate a bishop or episcopos above elders, also known as presbyters. In our churches, rather, under Christ, the elders, also known as presbyters, rule. I say all of this, incidentally, not because I consider Presbyterian church government a central aspect of the Christian faith. I do not. I, I mention this because it figures prominently in 1 Timothy and because I don't want any poor soul to belong to a Presbyterian church and not know what the word Presbyterian means. Let us pray.